Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults, which is administered by US Aging. My name is Meredith Hanley. I serve as the Director of Community Capacity Building at US Aging and oversee the Engaged Resource Center. Our webinar today is called Arts and Creative Engagement, Successful Programs, Activities, and Approaches. During the webinar today, Arts for the Aging will highlight the impacts that multidisciplinary participatory arts experiences can have on older adults and provide background on their work taking place locally and nationally in the creative aging field. Scripps Gerontology Center will provide an overview of the Opening Minds Through Art program and how aging network organizations can incorporate this program into their social engagement work. And the Central Vermont Council on Aging will spotlight their AAA's Creative Aging Initiative and the Creative Care Kit Project. And all the speakers today will also share tips and strategies for aging network organizations working to incorporate more arts programming into your social engagement work. Next slide. We have a few housekeeping items. All attendees of the webinar are in listen only mode for, for the duration of the webinar. So your microphone or your phone will be muted, but there are definitely still ways you can engage with our speakers today. Mainly you can submit questions for the presenters at any time during this presentation by clicking on the Zoom Q&A question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So you can just type your question in there and click submit. And you can do that at any time um, throughout the webinar to make sure that your, your question is um, in included at the end during the Q&A period. There's also a chat feature so you can click on the chat button to submit a question or a message. Also use that if you do need technical support, you can message us as the host and we'll, we'll do our best to help you out. And finally, the webinar will be recorded and we'll share a link with you to that recording in the next few days as well. Next, next slide. For those of you who are using a screen reader um, and want to silence un unwanted chatter in the chat and Q&A boxes, you can activate the speech on demand feature by pressing insert spacebar and then pressing the letter S on the keyboard. And for those of you who are not able to, to use the chat feature and would like technical assistance, you can raise or lower your hand by pressing Alt plus Y. Next slide. Before we move into our speakers, I did wanna share a little bit more information about Engaged. Again, Engaged, the National Resource Center for Engaging Older Adults is a national effort funded by the Administration for Community Living and what, what our aim to do is to increase the social engagement of older adults, as well as people with disabilities and caregivers by expanding and, and enhancing the aging network's capacity and reach to offer impactful interventions. And so much of our work focuses on identifying and disseminating information about emerging trends, resources, replication strategies, and best practices. And we're, um, again, administered by US Aging, but we're guided by a broader um, advisory committee with representatives from now 18 organizations and resource centers that help to provide their insights on social engagement from their fields of expertise. Next slide. And now I wanna introduce our speakers, our three fantastic speakers today. We're joined by Sarah House, Program Director for Arts for the Aging, Megan Young, Associate Director with Opening Minds Through Art, based out of the Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami University, and Luke Rackers, Director of Development and Communications at the Central Vermont Council on Aging. So with that, Sarah, I will pass it off to you to kick us off. Thank you so much, Meredith, and to US Aging for inviting me to contribute to this webinar. I'm Sarah House. I'm Arts for the Aging's Program Director. I'm a 40-ish white woman with shoulder length, wavy red hair. I'm sitting in my home office, which has gray walls and a bookshelf and artwork behind me. I joined Arts for the Aging in May 2020, right as people started to realize this pandemic wasn't going to be a short-term event. In my interview, I said I thrived on dealing with challenges, and I'm proud to say that it is also our organization, our teaching artists, and our participants who have been able to thrive because of our programs during the past year and a half. 
Arts for the Aging was formed in 1988 after a study with our late founder, Lolo Sarnoff and NIH showed that art making improved moods and behaviors in people with Alzheimer's. Lolo was a prolific artist, a scientist and a philanthropist. And this was the aha moment when these loves came together. Next slide, please. The breadth of our programming has grown from Lolo teaching the first workshops to now we have a faculty of 25 teaching artists in visual, performing, and literary arts disciplines. Our reach is in the greater Washington DC area and special projects and new virtual programs have taken us to other regions over the years. Regionally, we connect to, with 23 client sites virtually and six sites in person with plans to reconnect with more clients when it is safe to be in their communities. We partner with other cultural arts and community organizations like the Smithsonian, the Phillips Collection, Washington Chorus, and we are currently in talks with the Washington Ballet. Next slide, please. The core of our programming is our in-person workshops called Joy in Generation. These workshops are led by teaching artists trained in our methodologies of multi-sensory and multidisciplinary arts engagement. Our participants range from older adults living independently at home and engaged through senior centers, village organizations, and adult day centers to those living in continuing care communities, nursing homes, and assisted living communities. Research continues to prove that seniors who regularly engage in artistic practices, practices like singing, playing and listening to music, acting, dancing, and reading and creating poetry have a lower risk of dementia increased social connections, which reduces the negative health effects of loneliness, and it can actually slow the progression of cognitive decline. Techniques used by our teaching artists in these workshops include keeping workshops ideas simple yet dignified, using high quality artistic content, keeping the atmosphere friendly and open, and emphasizing participation and enjoyment, the process over the product, the progress over perfection. We use people's names to connect with them personally and repeat instructions slowly. We utilize positive reinforcement, patience. We embrace silence and we welcome emotion. And most important, we have a lot of fun. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, I joined the team at Arts for the Aging right as the pandemic began. My first task was to train up our teaching artists in how to present their workshops in a virtual format and encourage our clients to connect with their participants over Zoom. Of our 25 teaching artists, many of them older adults themselves, 21 made the transition to regular vir virtual programming. The first tactic was to meet people where they are in their comfort level of using technology, both teaching artists and participants. This screenshot is of a virtual program where I provided the screen share with a PowerPoint created by our programs and communications intern, Lenny Cuggins. I was supporting a collaborative program with two of our teaching artists exploring musical theater. The teaching artists were able to focus on the participants and on building social connections without the pressure of mastering technology. I have had the pleasure of attending and supporting hundreds of virtual programs over the last year and a half, and I've gotten to know many of our participants. One gentleman who attended this workshop series had said little more than hello and goodbye for almost a year of bi-weekly programs. One of the teaching artists coaxed him into reading a monologue along with her through gentle encouragement. Once he began, he read with such power and emotion, it was like a light switch flicked on. And from that moment, he was fully engaged and conversant for the rest of the series. It turns out he was involved in community theater when he was younger and simply hadn't emotionally connected with any of our previous workshop activities. Virtual programming is challenging, but it also provides wonderful opportunities to connect more deeply with participants who weren't able to attend in-person programs for a variety of reasons. Next slide, please. Arts for the Aging never wants to limit access to our programs based on availability of technology. So we developed a series of visual arts inspired hands-on art activities we've branded art kits. 
These include detailed photo illustrated instructions and all materials needed to create multiple works of art. The instructions also include conversation starters and open-ended questions to deepen social connections between participants and caregivers. Some clients deliver these heart kits with meals to residents at nursing homes, and others provide a Zoom login telephone number so participants can gather to work on the projects together with a teaching artist over a landline. Next slide, please. We also developed a series of pre-recorded videos for a client that explored different arts disciplines and were available on demand through their private YouTube channel. These eight to 10 minute videos evolved to include atmospheric closed captions, which capture the feelings of music, rhythm, and other sounds to enhance the experience for our deaf and hard of hearing participants. We are concluding a project for the University of Florida School of Medicine Jacksonville's Aging and Integrative Pain Assessment and Management Initiative, AIPAMI, in pain management. Six of our teaching artists and four researchers from Lesley University have collaborated to create 40-minute videos on how participating in the arts reduces perceptions of pain and increases positive perceptions of self. These videos also include audio descriptions for blind and low vision viewers. You can find these videos and other support materials on our website under special projects. Next slide, please. Since our founding, a field called creative aging, part of a larger field of arts and health has grown up around us. Scientific research continues to validate what many of us see in our work with older adults. The arts help build social connections. They access memories, they stimulate imaginations, and they improve health outcomes. There are vital health and wellness outcomes that regular arts participation induces. For older adults, there are statistically and significantly higher levels of five positive well being indicators interest, sustained attention, pleasure, self esteem, and normalcy. This is from the Americans for the Arts website, their Social Impact Explorer. There are physical changes that happen in the body when people participate in arts activities. They're connected to either the secretion or reduction of certain hormones. There's a decrease in cortisol levels, which means stress and anxiety are reduced. There's an increase in oxytocin levels. That's the love hormone. That can stimulate immune response, it helps us relax, and it enhances empathy, trust, and bonding. It increases dopamine levels. That's your happy hormone associated with having pleasurable experiences. Now that scientific evidence backs our work, we are envisioning how we can help advance a global agenda for arts and health. We are expanding our training curriculum and reach and grounding what we do with arts and health research. We are building strategic and sustainable alliances like with AI PAMI. We are living in profoundly traumatized and traumatizing times, and we know that the arts are a saving grace. Next slide, please. We're committed to accessibility and inclusion in our multisensory and multidisciplinary approaches. This means we have no other programs. All our programs engage all five senses and have points of accessibility for those with diminished or limited senses, especially sight and hearing, or with those for those with physical limitations. Multidisciplinary approaches to arts programming allows for multiple entry points for participants. By building collaborative programs, teaching artists bring the best of their art form into a new creation through pairings like poetry and movement, writing and acting, visual art and music. The possibilities are endless. Beyond the diversity of art forms, Arts for the Aging has a commitment to cultural and racial diversity and inclusion. We have organizational accomplishments in equity, diversity, and inclusion through our programming, fundraising and communications, our thought leadership, and operational infrastructure. This is leading to more and different revenue streams, more communications, more marketing, and community, community engagement. It's helping us recover from the pandemic in the short term and achieve long-term strategic goals, including closing a founding, founder succession period and endeavoring to become a fully equitable and anti-racist organization. 
We are committed to this task as we grow as an organization and as we hire additional teaching artists to meet the growing needs of our community. The need for arts programming is greater than any one organization can provide. Arts for the Aging is committed to helping others achieve the same success in their arts programming. We provide a variety of training models and support services, and we contract with local arts agencies to train artists in our methodologies. These trainings range from single training sessions that include demonstrations of our multi-sensory and multidisciplinary workshops and an exploration of our teaching artist guidelines to in-depth multi-day trainings with program shadowing and collaboration opportunities. The more artists that are trained to work with older adults of all abilities and health conditions, the better and stronger the community. Next slide, please. So what can you do? I don't want you to feel you have to immediately have this level of arts integration into your community or programs to have the benefits our participants see. Start small and tailor activities to your participants' interests. Do you have avid sports fans? Play Take Me Out to the Ball Game and have everyone sing along. Put on some music they like and start a gentle, seated, or standing dance party. Connect with local artists and members of your community to provide culturally relevant activities. Take virtual or in-person field trips to art museums and discuss what you see and feel when you look at art. There is no one social prescription for arts activities. Find what people like and do more of that. Then find ways to connect it to other arts disciplines and engage other senses. The more you connect and create together, the stronger you will be. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for joining me today. Please connect with us on social media to find out what Arts for the Aging is doing now. Now I will hand off to Megan Young, the Associate Director of Opening Minds Through Art at the Scripps Gerontology Center at Miami University. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks for making such a great case for um, arts and, and health and just how we can incorporate more into it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the program I work for, which is Opening Minds Through Art and how we can incorporate art, but through an intergenerational lens. So what does that look like? Next slide, please. So I will cover um, what the program is and what participants get out of the program. Um, our virtual OMA program that we adapted for the pandemic, um, how we continue to adapt it even more, and then ways that you can get involved or bring um, creative aging programming to your location. Next slide. So what is OMA? And you can go ahead right to the next one, Daria. <laughs> Thank you. So OMA stands for Opening Minds Through Art, and it's an intergenerational art program for people living with dementia. Um, it was developed in 2007 by Dr. Elizabeth Lika Lokan, who joined us for the call today, so I'm glad she's here. Um, it's been replicated in over 200 plus locations in North America, so in Canada and US specifically, um, with plans to go international. Um, Lika is taking OMA hopefully to uh, Indonesia on Fulbright next, either next fall or the, hopefully at some point um, she's been postponed, but we're hoping that she'll get there to take it there as well. Um, but it's been in other international locations too. Um, we've had almost 2,500 Miami students go through the program here at our local community, but that doesn't include all the students at all the other locations. Um, it's won numerous awards, like I said, the Fulbright Award, but also um, different um, Alzheimer's kind of um, program at, programmatic awards as well. And we've done research on um, both the benefits for the older adults and the younger uh, volunteers that participate. Next slide. So OMA is um, inspired by modern, modern abstract art. So you'll see some flashes of images here. Um, when Lika developed the program, she noticed the type of art programming that was available to residents living in nursing homes and um, 
instead of focusing on intact cognition and making sure things fit a certain way or look a certain way, um, she wanted to break that, that norm and allow people to just create and express themselves through art. And so all of these have been painted by people living with dementia um, with the assistance of a volunteer next to them. And they get to title them and they get to feel proud of them and they get to showcase their work um, in a way that's beautiful. And then at the end of the semester, we have a huge art show. We invite everybody to come, students, older adult participants, family members, um, just to celebrate such a great year and a semester that they all had together creating their friendships. And so I have a quick two minute video just to give you a little bit more um, background about the program in case I missed any, any important points. People with intact cognitions oftentimes try to free ourselves from the limitation of having to draw this thing that looks like that, you know? And when you are free from that, you can then break into the abstract world more directly. So when the ability to express is impaired, they think the content is gone. And that's where the violation of human rights come in because the human is still there. It's just that they are locked behind the disease. It doesn't mean that there isn't somebody in there that's trying to express. And so art is a sort of a, a channel when logical thinking and verbal expression is impaired, art is still there for them to express. OMA is an intergenerational art program for people with dementia based at Scripps Gerontology Center. We put people with dementia one-on-one -on -one with Miami students. The students then facilitate the creative process of the elders so that the elders can express themselves in creating art on their own. And when I see what I do, and I realize how it comes out, I'm besides myself. Yes, it's called snowflakes. And I, I, I know that it doesn't look like snowflakes, but it's my vision of what snowflakes should look like. It's very interesting. It makes you stop and think. It makes you wonder. So the mission of the program is building bridges across age and cognitive barriers. So that bridge is actually relationship, and within that relationship at the foundation is love. Give her a little <laughs> So the video showcased kind of that one-to-one -one connection that students and um, their older adult partner get to do. And so they're paired up. I, I failed to mention they're paired up for the entire semester with the same person. So they really get to know their partner really, really well. Um, so what do people get from doing OMA? And this is just a very, very quick, brief overview of the research. But if you want to head to the next slide, Daria. Um, you can read more on our website. We have a whole tab of research articles that have been published. And like Sarah was talking about, we're so uh, grateful to have the experience that we do at the Scripps Gerontology Center to be able to publish and um, look into these topics for advancing arts and health. Um, but particularly, we've, we've looked at both students and the older adults that participate. And most, mostly the main finding that we found for the older adults, it's increased after each session. Um, we asked them about their mood before the session and the mo their mood after the session. Um, and almost always their mood has increased. They feel, you know, they're much happier after the session. And then students, they get a sense of, um, instead of kind of pushing away older adults or not engaging with older adults, they're kind of um, able to make this connection and then figure out that they can actually communicate with somebody living with dementia. They actually like the person, not just kind of tolerating, but actually liking them. Um, and so it, there's a bunch of fascinating research that um, our team here has done. If you're interested, it's all available on our website. But the gist of it is we've only seen good things and benefits for everybody. Next slide, please. So just to 
talk a little bit about how we adapted OMA for the pandemic. Obviously, our in-person program, which is what I've been talking in a book about, um, had, to, had to cease just because of all of the nursing homes closing, and we had to figure out what do we do next. And so we went to virtual OMA. Next slide, please. And we called it virtual OMA. We gathered students um, into breakout rooms. We paired two students together with a teaching assistant who had been through the program before. Um, and then they got paired with one older adult. And so we invited older adults living with and without dementia. And most of our participants actually came from community settings. So community members, um, the majority of them in our virtual program don't have dementia, we'd say, but we don't ask that information. Um, but everyone is welcome, I guess, is the point of that. And instead of just focusing on visual arts, we focused on art, music, story building, poetry, a bunch of different, we pulled expertise from creative aging and kind of put together this whole um, agenda of activities that the students can then do with their older adult partner. And they met weekly throughout the semester again for about um, 45 to 60 minutes each week. Next slide, please. So these are just some comments about um, the, from the participants themselves. So the older adults were really touched by um, the students' authenticity and the way that the students really engaged and cared and wanted to do this program with them. Um, but we got a lot about how amazing the program is. It's a gift. It's an excellent tether during the pandemic. Um, the content was fascinating and surprisingly challenging and well presented. So the older adults really appreciated the kind of whole package deal. Um, next slide, please. And the students talked more about how they realized that older adults are capable of the same things that they are, if not more. Um, so everyone, we believe everyone is able at to express themselves creatively. And so that's in that first quote, that's what the student realized is everyone is able to do that. Um, students learn how to actually form a relationship. They learn how to listen well and be respectful and, and maintain that relationship throughout the semester. And they learn that it's not just a one-way street. We're not just asking questions, trying to get to know the older person, but the older person really wants to get to know the student as well. And so that's what we pride ourselves on, that intergenerational interaction that goes both ways, not just um, focusing on one party. Next slide, please. And so we've had to do a little bit of adapting since, again, pandemic. Um, when our when senior services and other things started opening up around us, we um, decided to go into different locations that we normally wouldn't. So next slide. Um, a group of students actually started going to a senior center close to us. And so instead of doing kind of the one-on-one -on -one with just making one with the student helping the older adult, um, these students came to the senior center and we just advertised the class as an abstract art making class. And we had community members come and it was great fun. And um, they all enjoyed the projects, but the students actually got to work on the projects too. So it was kind of like everyone got to do a little bit of art um, to break up our week. And so we did this weekly as well. And we've also been going to an adult day um, center in town as well for several years. Um, and those clients also really enjoy the program too. Next slide. So I just have a few quick ways to share with you about how to get involved. Um, we have multiple things going on for different levels, depending on what kind of um, resource you need. So let's go to the next slide. I'll walk through each one. So we have, like I mentioned, those Zoom classes. We have these classes that will be coming up um, in the spring. And so we're always looking for participants to join. Um, it's a first come, first serve sign up, and we'll send that out in the spring with more details. But you can email us. Uh, the email address is there, and you'll get all the information about it. But it's a free program, um, and, you'll, and your clients will have to be available for about 10 weeks. Um, and it's about an hour a week from February through May. Next slide. Um, our creative caregiving guide is actually a really great free resource. It's kind of a stagnant resource. We um, 
it was created in partnership with the National Center for Creative Aging, I believe, I may have gotten that name wrong, but which has since folded, but we were able to take all the resources and put them up on our website to share with you. And so if you go to the web address there, caregiving.scripsoma.org, all of these great lessons um, from master teaching artists in their field um, share with you how to do these programs at home for, for caregivers specifically, but other people can use them too in their, in their creative aging programming. Next slide, please. We also have an OMA facilitator training. So this is more for those who would like to bring um, the in-person program to their location. Um, we have two formats of that. You can do a fully online training, no travel required. We ship all the materials to you with um, Zoom sessions. And then we have a hybrid training, which is located in um, Ohio and in Virginia as well. And so the cost of that is $750. Um, and if you want more information, again, that's all on our website. Next slide, please. And then this is something we're really excited about and hopefully we'll be able to share more through um, US aging in the future, but just the opportunity for um, what's coming next for us. And so with this virtual OMA class, we were really excited to develop a new program um, that will be available and free and, and to all. And so um, we're calling it Scripps AVID and AVID stands for Arts-Based, Virtual, Intergenerational, and Dementia-Friendly. And essentially it's gonna be all those activities I talked about from the virtual OMA class, art, storytelling, um, poetry, everything like that, combining it putting it up on a video chat platform. So it'll be more of a one-to-one -one connection. You'll get matched in the back end. You'll, you'll each have a partner, get matched, pick an activity to do and do it together. Um, and so we're hoping to make it accessible and friendly so that even per people living with um, dementia can go on and know where to click exactly and how to get to their resources. And that so students too, medical students or other students in professions that could lead to professions in aging, um, know how to interact with the clients as well. Next slide, please. So that's all I have um, for my 15 minute session today. Thank you so much. The website there is scriptsoma.org if you'd like any other information. Um, the email address is scriptsoma at miamioh.edu and I'll put those in the chat right after I finish talking. Um, feel free to follow us along on social media through all of our exciting new um, programming and things that we'll be doing. And um, I thank again USA Aging for their, their, this opportunity to share. So I think I will hand it over to Luke next. Next slide, please. Hello everyone, and many thanks to the Engage team at US Aging for organizing today's webinar around this important topic. My name is Luke Rackers, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at the Central Vermont Council on Aging. Today, I will be sharing an overview of our Creative Care Kit project, which is part of our larger Creative Aging initiative. We started the Creative Care Kit project to help provide social connection through creativity for homebound older adults during the pandemic, and we hope it will continue to flourish well into the future. Next slide. Here's a description of creative aging to set the stage. Creative aging activities promote positive psychological, physical, and emotional well being through engagement with skills based, social centric, and practice focused creative opportunities. Creative aging is an important component of healthy aging for those who seek to share, expand, and unlock their capacity for self-expression and reflection, meaningful connection, lifelong learning, and personal growth through the lifespan. Next slide. Here are just a few of the reasons why creative aging opportunities are important for healthy aging. As my fellow participants noted, research continues to show that the arts are a powerful mechanism for improving well-being. Next slide. Dr. Jean Cohen, author of The Creative Age and pioneer in the field of creative aging, reminds us that even when we recognize the value of creativity, too often we remain blind to the presence and potential of creativity throughout our lifespan. Next slide. 
Our vision is clouded, most of all, by stereotypes, misunderstanding, and ignorance about aging, and then muddled more by stereotypes of creativity as belonging only to the artist's domain. Next slide. There are many creative barriers and blocks that can prevent people from engaging in creative aging activities and for aging services professionals to develop these opportunities. With our Creative Care Kit project, we hope to reduce these barriers so that older adults can feel comfortable participating and courageous in sharing their work, thoughts, and ideas, opening doorways for new experiences and meaningful connections. Next slide. Another quote from Dr. Cohen. Some people have had more opportunity and fewer obstacles in acquiring experience and expertise. Some have had a, the good fortune of ample exposure to positive influence and opportunities. Next slide. But it is never too late to benefit from new opportunities and positive influences. Next slide. With our Creative Care Kit project, we set out to develop an opportunity that was accessible for homebound older adults. There are many wonderful organizations in central Vermont who offer in-person classes, but we knew there was a gap in opportunity for those who are homebound. When the pandemic started, that gap grew much wider, making it even more important for us to provide well-designed opportunities for people to complete at home while also enhancing social connection. Next slide. We strive to provide creative motivation for people at home. This comprehensive effort requires time, resources, and perseverance to ensure that all factors in this cycle of creative motivation are addressed. The activity should focus on skill building and encourage practice over an extended time. Social connectedness is key to this effort, whether through connection with the teaching artists, with peers and volunteers, with family and friends, and or connecting people and their creative work to others in the community. The activities should also empower people to reflect and express themselves freely, opening the door for meaningful connection. Next slide. In addition to addressing creative motivation through skill building, self-expression, and social connection, our goals include alleviating the opportunity gap for homebound older adults, showcasing the creative work in the community, bridging the digital divide, and facilitating peer-to-peer -peer and intergenerational connection. Next slide. Now for the fun part, let's take a closer look at the kits. Next slide. Our pilot project included watercolor kits with enough supplies and materials to last several months, plus a book that provided practice space. The binder included an abstract watercolor activity and a watercolor activity focused on everyday objects, both designed by professional teaching artists. The binder also included a music activity, beautiful questions from time slips to help inspire the work and spark conversations, as well as resources from CVCOA. The kits included a pack of blank handmade greeting cards so that people could share their skills with friends and family. Next slide. This is one of my favorite photos sent to me unprompted showing a caregiver and kit recipient playing with color. The key word here being playing. This, pop, this provides a path for care partners to have positive experiences together. Next slide. This is the work of one very prolific older artist who is engaging with watercolor for the first time and having lots of fun playing with color. Next slide. These are two examples of painting everyday objects. I loved this activity because it was such a powerful way for folks to connect and tell stories about the objects that are meaningful to them. Next slide. Here's an example of a painting created from an abstract watercolor activity. Next slide. The teaching artists recorded instructional videos during the winter to motivate participants. This was a work created after viewing the abstract watercolor video called Painting the Night Sky. Next slide. We encourage participants to share their works in process. For me, this is just as, if not more important than experiencing the finished work. By sharing the works in process, we can learn more about the story and meaning behind the work. This is one great example that helped inspire conversations between the kit recipient and creative companion. Next slide. This painting is an intimate look at the artist's beloved pet. 
The recipient shared with me that she would not have expressed her deep gratitude for her furry friend without the opportunity to reflect deeply and look at the relationship in a new way through the painting. Next slide. One kit recipient painted cute animals on, hand, on the handmade greeting cards to give to her first great grandchild due to be born a few months after this painting. All of the work that I've shared with you and much more was included in a virtual art show this past April to celebrate and honor the creative work, artistic voices, and stories of these artists. Next slide. We surveyed the participants at the end of the pilot project. 75% answered yes or maybe to developing new social connections, 65% yes or maybe to strengthening existing social connections, and 97% indicated their interest in participating again. Next slide. A new collaboration between CVCOA and the Vermont Arts Council arose after the pilot project, helping us make some key changes for the second iteration and integrate lessons learned into the new design. This year, we have two kit options to provide choice. Both kits include a primary activity and a supplemental activity designed by professional teaching artists trained in creative aging best practices through Lifetime Arts. We are also organizing group Zoom gatherings with the teaching artists this year, along with pre-recorded instructional videos. In addition to their creative companion connections, kit recipients can also attend open virtual studio sessions and are once again encouraged to share their work for our celebration event in the spring. Next slide. A quick overview of our timeline. The summer included teaching artist training, activity binder development, and ordering of supplies and materials. In the fall, teaching artists created their videos, volunteers delivered kits, creative companions started calling, and participants attended the first group Zoom session. The winter is focused on continued skill building and social connection with the help of creative companions and group opportunities. In the spring, we shift gears to planning our creative aging celebration event. Next slide. Here's a look at the kit contents for this project round. Next slide. Features of the kits include resource binders containing the sequential written activities, optional technology to encourage sharing of work, and enough high quality supplies and materials to allow for several months of practice. Next slide. Here's the front cover of the activity binder for the storytelling through drawing kit with the supplemental activity called the Life Path Project. Next slide. And this is the cover for the art inspired, writing art inspired poetry kit with a supplemental bookmaking activity. Next slide. Here's a view of the kit contents for both kits. One of the challenge was combining the primary activity with the most appropriate supplemental activity so that there was considerable supply and material crossover within each kit. Next slide. Participants could choose to receive an iPad, tech training, and internet connection as part of their kit. Training includes calls from our partner, Technology for Tomorrow, and then ongoing support from our community-engaged tech specialist staff person and tech volunteers. 32 of the kit recipients have chosen to engage with technology as part of receiving a kit this year. One person who received their iPad was able to join the group Zoom session with other participants last week because of this option. Next slide. And this project would not be possible without our amazing volunteers. Next slide. Volunteer drivers delivered 160 kits last year and 70 kits so far this year, just in time to connect with people before the holidays and bring some warmth as the cold weather came to Vermont. One volunteer dressed up to, to provide some extra cheer. Next slide. The professional teaching artists created a tip sheet for creative companion volunteers to train them in leading conversations around creativity and the activities. These creative companions are courageous individuals who play an integral role in motivating kit recipients, embracing the creative journey alongside them. Next slide. The creative companion volunteer role includes contacting their cohort a few times per month, completing all of the activities, encouraging continued practice and sharing of the work, and leading conversations. Next slide. 
Mary is a great example of a Creative Companion volunteer this year. While reluctant at first due to health concerns, Mary knew that being a Creative Companion would provide much needed social connection and motivation. And as soon as she received her kit, she jumped right in using a page from The Adventures of Tin Tin, one of her favorite comic series, to create her first creative work for the project. Next slide. Adding her own unique style and whimsy, Mary titled this piece, Man Confused by Finding Himself Standing in Front of a Large Cabbage. Because of Mary's courage and dedication, she already has a conversation starter for her cohort of kit recipients. They can discuss their favorite comics, why Mary chose this page, how she developed this work starting with tracing paper, and much more. Next slide. In the final survey at the end of the pilot project, we asked kit recipients to tell us what being creative means to them. At the start of this second project, we asked people to tell us why they were motivated to engage in creativity. Next slide. I am always interested in creativity. It's particularly important now with COVID and the new variant on the loose. We all need good ways to express ourselves. This was a common sentiment shared by many participants Others included keeping the mind busy, trying something new, connecting with others, finding inspiration, relieving stress, expressing themselves, undertaking a new adventure, and having fun with a care partner. Next slide. Many also brought up health limitations and recent health challenges. Here's one example. Mobility issues are making it difficult to get out and about. Rising COVID cases make it less likely that I will want to gather in enclosed spaces. Next slide. I enjoy doing artwork, but I find it most difficult to do in a vacuum. Next slide. These examples show the desperation of some older adults and their desire for motivation and meaningful connection. Some kit recipients also self-reported suffering from severe depression and anxiety and were seeking human connection. Next slide. Here are a few more voices. I want to write love notes for my wife when we are apart. I want to watch much less TV. I love doing things with my hands. I think it's incredibly important to share the voices of these participants and to learn from their experiences and desires for future projects. Next slide. Finally, we are very excited to be partnering with the Vermont Arts Council for this project. This capacity building effort includes sharing our project experiences and toolkits with other area agencies on aging for replication, training teaching artists, developing a creative aging resource hub, and developing a networking website to bring volunteers and creative aging services professionals together to learn about creative aging best practices. Next slide. So let's get creative. These questions are constantly on my mind. How can we continue to uplift creative aging as an integral component of healthy aging? How can we help older adults overcome creative barriers and blocks, particularly for homebound older adults? Healthy aging includes opportunities to enhance social connectedness through creativity and the choice to stay connected to the communities that people know and love. Next slide. Many thanks for joining today. Thank you, Luke, and all that was, those are really, really terrific presentations. Um, so we, we do what we will be moving to questions shortly, but I, I did want to highlight just a few items from Engaged first. So, um, so just a couple of these resources. At the, at the top of this slide here, you'll see um, a mention of our Innovations Hub. That is a searchable database of innovative and replicable a local social engagement programming. So if you're looking for even more examples beyond the amazing examples that were shared today, visit our website and that link will be on the next slide. Um, but again, it's a searchable database and, um, and also we're always looking for new submissions. So you can also share your innovations with us through a survey monkey link that is also on our website. But we also have an array of other resources, including toolkits and temp template materials, videos, consumer brochures, month a monthly newsletter and blog, all focused on, again, increasing the social engagement of older adults, people with disabilities, um, and caregivers as well. Next slide. As I mentioned, this is where you would find 
um, information for Engaged by visiting our website at www.engagingolderadults.org. We also have social media. If you, if you don't have a chance to write this all down, that's fine. If you just Google engagingolderadults.org, you will then find a link to our social media and email address as well. Next slide. I did want to also flag an initiative called Commit to Connect, which is a campaign developed by the Administration for Community Living, which is addressing social isolation by building a network of champions, connecting socially isolated people to resources and establishing partnerships. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, you can visit the Commit to Connect website at hcl.gov forward slash commit to connect. Next slide. So now we do wanna to pivot to questions and discussions. We've seen some questions come in via the chat and also the Q and A box. So thank you for that. If you haven't typed in your question yet, now is a great time to do so. Um, Caitlin, I will pass it to you to guide us through the Q and A and all of the panelists, please go ahead and turn your webcams back on. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Meredith. Let's just dive right in. We got a bunch of questions from our attendees. This seems like a very popular question. So this one's for you, Luke. How much do the creative care kits cost and how are the kits funded? Um, so last year, uh, the kits um, cost about uh, 70 to $80 uh, per kit. Um, this year, that cost has increased um, in part because uh, we are including both a primary and supplement supplemental activity. And so the um, hard cost for the kits this year was uh, closer to $90. Uh, but then of course we have we have other costs related to it. So that's just the cost of the actual kit supplies and materials and printing of the binder. Um, the funding ranges, uh, this is a, a, a project that certainly takes a lot of resources. So we have uh, funding from a lot of different sources. Um, AARP uh, provided funding for our um, pilot project last year, um, along with lots of local funding and private donors. Um, and this year, uh, we had funding from Meals on Wheels America, and that was specifically to help uh, provide the tech option uh, for the kits this year to help alleviate that social isolation through technology for homebound older adults. Um, and we also have some support uh, from the Vermont Arts Council um, through a grant from Aroha Flint philanthropies, um, and then lots of local funding. Um, so it takes takes a whole community uh, to put this project together. Thank you. All right, moving on. Megan, this question is for you. Do you plan to keep virtual classes for the long term? Will you be doing any hybrid classes where it's in-person and virtual attendees at the same time? I don't know that we'll have any kind of programming like that just because our in-person is very strictly in-person and we're typically working more with um, people with more moderate to late stages of dementia, whereas the virtual, um, it's more early stage or no dementia. And so I don't know that we'll ever have like a hybrid class section, but we do have specific programs depending on the needs of the participant. Great. Sarah, we had a comment question from one of our attendees. They wanted to know if it would be possible to access some of the recorded videos that you had shared during your presentation. Yes, in fact, here, I'll, I'll drop in the chat the direct link to our website for our projects with AI PAMI. Those are public and, and free for everyone to view. Our full length eight to 10 minute ones are bespoke for our clients. And so we only have promos, but that's available on Vimeo. I'll have to search up that link and share. But if you go to vimeo.com and look for Arts for the Aging, we have a wide variety of promos and other info and videos of, of things that we do, including virtual exhibitions. Because we were limited during the pandemic, we couldn't do visual arts hanging on walls. So we actually recorded Zoom sessions and then edit it down to about a 10 minute virtual exhibition that shows participants singing along, participating and creating art um, during our workshops. So please check out Vimeo with Arts for the Aging. That's great, thank you for sharing that link. 
This next question is for all of our speakers. So we will just go right in the order that you all presented. So we'll start with Sarah. If someone is interested in bringing any of these efforts to their agencies, what is one tip that you have for getting started? Art Local, you have so many artists in your area who are desperate to connect in some way. So if you have um, local arts agencies that have posts about artists or you post an option, that's a great way to connect with, with someone you have available. We are always happy to provide trainings so we can help train them up in our, in our methodologies, but I'm always big on pay artists, hire someone local and get them involved. Great advice. Uh, Megan, do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, please. If someone is interested in bringing any of these efforts to their agencies, what is one tip you have for getting started? Thank you. Um, I think for our program specifically, again, it focuses on that intergenerational, um, which we believe is like the heart of it all. And so I think if you can reach out to local colleges or universities or do some kind of intergenerational programming, even if it's not art related, I think that um, is a really beneficial thing too for everybody. But that bo added bonus of doing art is obviously, as we've talked about today, is very um, important too. Great. Luke, any advice that you would give to agencies who wanted to start a similar program? Uh, yeah, two things. Um, find out what the community is looking for and where a gap might be. Um, and then also I'll echo um, paying professional teaching artists. Uh, the activities in our kits um, are specific to those professional teaching artists and uh, teaching artists who are specifically trained in creative aging best practices. So they are designing these activities uh, with creative aging uh, in mind so that these uh, activities are well designed uh, for those we are serving. Thank you all. Let's see what other questions we have. All right, here's one for Luke. How did you close the technology gap for lower income participants or participants uncomfortable with technology? Uh, there are really two keys to that here at CBCOA. We have an internal a staff person, a community engaged tech specialist. Um, so they are a key staff person in this role, um, both in helping organize the tech piece um, and um, having contact with uh, the recipients of that tech. We are also partner, um, partnering with a group here called Technology for Tomorrow. Um, and those are the folks who are providing the uh, initial setup of the device and doing the initial training um, so that it's really a team effort uh, between uh, my department here, our community engaged tech specialist and our partners technology for tomorrow uh, because it is a, a very complex uh, undertaking to think of that device, um, the connectivity and the training and how all of those pieces work together. Uh, and so we, we take our time with each person to make sure we're addressing uh, their individual needs. So it's a very individualized approach. Thank you. And Megan or Sarah, would you want to weigh in on this question or have any thoughts about closing the technology gap for lower income participants or people that are unfamiliar, uncomfortable with technology? Any thoughts with that? Sarah, you can go first if you have any. One thing we've done is, like I said in my presentation, reach them where they are. You know, if a landline is all they have, Zoom has options, you know, they have phone numbers they can call in. It takes a little patience and support. Our, thankfully, our client staff have been very helpful at making sure their participants get logged on in that way. But if you can access them at one level and get them comfortable with, you know, calling into Zoom from a landline, then they might be willing to make the next step, you know, someone getting them on, on a tablet and just make baby steps as you go. And not restricting because it may not just be technology issue, it may be a financial issue and respecting their, their limitations in that sense and reaching them as much as possible and not excluding because of lack of technology. I think I'd have to echo what Sarah said. Um, we had a participant a couple of semesters ago who just called in on the phone because he couldn't figure out how to use Zoom. Um, 
and I think that's probably more common too in more rural areas. I know where Miami is located um, outside of Miami is more rural. Um, so I think that's probably your best bet. Um, we're hoping with, even though Scripps Avid will be online, we're hoping that we'll create some kind of, you know, book or resource or something so that all those activities are still accessible to anyone who wants to use them. But again, they just have to kind of hop on the phone and have them that way. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. I'm going to turn it back over to Meredith. Great. Thank you um, in guiding us through that Q&A, Caitlin. And of course, thank you to all of our speakers today for those really excellent presentations and sharing your expertise and insights with all of us. Just a quick wrap up here. Um, there will be a survey that is displayed in your browser after the Zoom call ends. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to complete that um, survey, we'd really appreciate it. We um, thank you for your feedback and we use it to guide and shape our work. I do see a couple questions still coming into the chat, which we won't have time to get to, but if you'd like to email engaged, which again, you can find um, on our website, you can, we can help connect you with any speakers or, or resources as well. So, and again, the recording of today's webinar will be shared in a follow-up email and also available on our website in the next few days. So I just wanna do a final thank you to, of course, our speakers, but also those of you who spent a little time with us today. We hope it's helpful in your social engagement and creative arts related efforts. So thanks so much and have a great day. Bye everybody.